I had a few kind responses from an earlier video I did where I progressed a sentence from Proto-Germanic to Modern English, so I thought today I'd go through a list of Proto-Germanic words and track their development through all the reconstructed sound changes that they underwent to become Modern English words. And I won't be talking too much about the methods of reconstruction here because I think that would make the video too long. So I've chosen eight words. Uh, most of these did actually survive to leave descendants in Modern English. One of them didn't, at least as far as I'm aware. So we're going to put that through the historical sound changes anyway to produce what it would have probably would have looked like if it had survived to modern English. So we start in the late Scandinavian Iron Age, let's say very roughly 100 BC. So to go through our words quickly, we have chapraz, which was probably goat. Then we have fuglas, which probably meant something like bird. It was probably the normal generic word for bird. Then we have dona which was a uh, verb meaning to do. Then we have rans, which meant goose. Then we have moose, which meant mouse. And mooses, which meant mice. And then daras, which meant day. And then a bit of a curveball, apo. This is a word that left descendants in a lot of Germanic languages. Uh, and the form of those descendants shows that this word almost certainly existed in Proto-Germanic in the late Iron Age. It wasn't just loaned into the other languages later on. But the meaning is kind of a matter of speculation, because in all the descendant languages it's ended up meaning monkey or ape. And obviously there are no native monkey or ape species in Northern Europe apart from humans. So there are a couple of theories. One is that uh, it was ultimately a loan word from a language whose speakers did encounter monkeys a lot. So maybe it's been loaned from some African or Asian language and Proto-Germanic speakers have just always been aware of the existence of monkeys even though most of them had never seen one. Um, this, is, this is completely believable as far as I'm concerned. There's no reason to think that Proto-Germanic speakers were somehow isolated from the rest of the world. They traded with other parts of the world. They could easily have had a cultural awareness of monkeys even though none lived around them. Um, but, yeah, that's... There, there are various potential explanations for the, the existence of that word in Proto-Germanic. The first change that affects our list of words is I mutation, and I've talked about this in a previous video, so I'll only briefly go over it again. Whenever you have a back vowel like U, O, A, and it's followed by an E sound in the next syllable, you start to pronounce the back vowel with the tongue towards the front of the mouth. And this is called assimilation, because it's one vowel assimilating to the quality of another. And this only affects one word in our list, mooses, and this starts to be pronounced mooses. So the oo uh, gains the front tongue position even though the lips stay rounded. Oo becomes oo, mooses becomes mooses. And this is an allophonic change, so speakers probably didn't notice it as a significant thing at the time. It was just a small gradual alteration to the way people spoke. This kind of fronting sound change is actually happening to the U vowel for a lot of English speakers today, so I find myself saying you instead of you sometimes. Bear in mind this didn't happen in the word moose, the singular, because that doesn't have the necessary condition of being followed by a syllable containing e. So you have this alternation, one moose, many mooses. The next relevant sound change only applies to the word upper. This word has a feature reconstructed in Proto-Germanic which is rare even among modern languages, which is an overlong vowel. Some languages, including a few dialects of English, make an important distinction between short and long vowels. So for me, for example, e eh and er form a short long pair, the difference between bed and bed. That's a two-way length distinction between short and long vowels. It's very rare, but some languages make a three-way distinction short, long, and over long. Um, and as I say, this is pretty rare in modern languages. Estonian is the only one I can think of, but it seems to have existed in Proto-Germanic, and this word, upper, had an overlong vowel at the end. At this point in the development of the language, the distinction between long and overlong vowels collapsed, so all the overlong vowels just became normal long vowels. Upper became upper. The next relevant change affects a few of our words. It was the z sound disappearing from the ends of words. And this is very similar to a change that sometimes happens in Castilian Spanish, where s disappears from the ends of words. So, mas can sometimes be ma in rapid speech. So this affects chapras, which becomes chapra, fuglas becomes fugla, musis becomes musi. So now it's just one moose, many musi. 
and Daraz becomes Dara. A few more sound changes don't really affect our list of words. And then there's one which I'll mention that must have happened at some point between Proto-Germanic and Old English, but it's not clear exactly when, so I'll just put it here at this point. And that's that this F sound made with both lips becomes a modern English F sound made with the top teeth and bottom lip. And also, where you have H at the start of a word, at some point it just becomes H, like how in Spanish you have some dialects that say viejo and some that say viejo. This H becomes H. So, Jafra becomes Jafra, and Fugla becomes Fugla. Eventually, we get to a big and often mentioned sound change, which is the Anglo-Frisian nasal spirant law. By this point, Proto-Germanic is probably well differentiated into different dialects. One of them in Scandinavia is on its way to becoming Old Norse, one is on its way to becoming Old High German, and in the cluster of Germanic dialects that evolved into English and Frisian, you get this sound change where if you have a vowel, then a nasal, like m, n, then a fricative, like ch, f, s, the nasal consonant disappeared, but kind of got absorbed into the vowel and made it longer. And those are both common processes. If a consonant disappears after a vowel, you often get this effect called compensatory lengthening, where the vowel gets longer to make up for the time you would have spent saying the consonant. And also, often nasal consonants cause vowels near them to nasalize, so both these sound changes are quite common. I'll link a really good video in the description about this topic, but here it affects the word rance, which becomes rance. Possibly at the same time, or possibly shortly afterwards, this nasal vowel gained an increased tongue height and became something like rance. At some point again, it's hard to tell the date, the R vowel quality raised to O, and in other words, the air vowel quality probably raised to E. So in this case, it means that rance becomes rance. And then you start to get other sound changes characteristic of Old English and Old Frisian. If you have a or nasal a in the last syllable of a word, it disappears. I think this means that hafra, which ends in a, would become hafir. Notice that an extra vowel is inserted here because our Proto-English doesn't allow r to be in a syllable all on its own. And fugla loses its final vowel a and becomes fugl. Again, a vowel appears because the l can't exist in a syllable on its own. Dara becomes dar. And then you have a change called Anglo-Frisian brightening. Any remaining a uh vowels take a front tongue position, a, uh, unless the next syllable has a vowel with a back tongue position, like u, uh, o, uh, or another a. Uh. So in this case, dar becomes dar, hafir becomes hafir. Then you get one of the most significant sound changes in our sequence, which is palatalization. This affects the sounds k and r, when they're immediately next to front vowels, like i, u, E and A. In our word list, this only actually affects DAG because you have this R straight after a front vowel, A, uh, and so it ends up being pronounced with a more fronted tongue position. So instead of DAG, you get DAI and eventually DAI. At some stage, other instances of this R sound harden to G. So RONS becomes GORS. And then at some point, this vowel loses its nasal characteristic and it just becomes gorse. The g didn't harden to g if it came between two vowels, so the word fugol stays the same. I and u disappear at the ends of words unless they come after a short syllable. So musi becomes just muse. So now you have one moose, many muse. And at some point after that stage, but before the time of textbook Old English, a rule developed where if f, s, th were between two voiced sounds, which is two sounds made with the vocal folds vibrating, then they themselves would become voiced v, z, th. So our hypothetical word hafir would become haver. A few other changes pass without really affecting our list, and then a change takes place where long all gets reduced to a uh when it's at the end of a word. So apor becomes apa. This might seem like a bit of a jump, but a long vowel shortening in an unstressed syllable is pretty normal across languages worldwide. And then all that needs to happen is that the lips need to become unrounded and the tongue maybe needs to get a bit lower. And you have a. Uh. So think about how I say caught, but an American English speaker might say cart. 
Here we've arrived at basically the way these words were pronounced in late West Saxon Old English around the year 900 or 1000. Haver, Fugol, Dawn, Gos, Moose, Mies, Dai, Upper. From this point onwards, we approach the period that historians think of as the Middle English period through the Norman invasion in the 1060s. Here the front A and the back A vowels merge into one vowel, and that's probably fairly low and central. So Haver becomes Haver, Dai becomes Dai, Appa becomes Appa. Then you have a change where the R sound probably labialises first, so it comes to be pronounced with rounded lips. Wa, a wa, and then it just becomes w in certain environments. So fool here becomes something like fool, and eventually it gets reduced to just one syllable. Fool becomes just fool. A change spread through early Middle English gradually, whereby any vowel pronounced with the tongue at the front of the mouth and the lips rounded, like u or u, reverted to its non-lip rounding equivalent. But it does mean that moose came to be pronounced mies. So now you have one moose and many mies. And then creeping towards Chaucer's time, we have a change called open syllable lengthening, where short vowels became long if they were in an open syllable. That is a syllable that didn't end in a consonant. So I'm going to tell you that this applies to the word appa, and it would apply to the word haver, although I think at this point in history, Haver may have fallen out of use as a word, although it probably still existed in regional dialects. So from now on we're going to progress it through the sound changes, but it's going to be hypothetical because it didn't actually survive to modern English. So open syllable lengthening applies to the a uh in both of these words. The first a uh in upper. So how do we know that these syllables were open? We're assuming that these words are syllabified like ha ver and a ba. But how do we know it's not have er and ap a, in which case these vowels would be in closed syllables because they'd have a consonant at the end? This is because of something called the maximum onset principle. At least in English, a lot of attested sound changes only make sense and only appear consistent if you assume that a consonant is at the start of a syllable wherever possible. So the vowels become long. Haver becomes haver and apa becomes apa. At some point in due course, vowels in unstressed syllables mostly get reduced to a central vowel like a. Uh. Haver becomes haver, apa becomes apa. And then eventually this central vowel is worn away if it appears at the ends of words, so apa becomes ap. At some point in due course, as the inflection system of Middle English declines slowly, verbs eventually lose a lot of their endings, uh, including the infinitive ending n. So the infinitive form of, of dawn just becomes the stem of the word with no n sound at the end. Dor. So now we've arrived at a pronunciation system probably similar to the one uh, someone like Chaucer used. Haver, fool, dor, gos, moose, mies, die, ap. This is where we hit the great vowel shift, where all of the long vowels take a higher tongue position except for E and U, which become gliding vowels or diphthongs, because they already have the highest possible tongue position. Fool becomes foal, mies becomes mace, and moose becomes mose. So now it's one mose and many mace. The vowel in our hypothetical word, haver, would become a, haver, and then er, haver. By the same process, ap becomes ap and then ep. Do became do, gos became goose. The i diphthong in the word die smoothed, probably eventually landing on a quality like air, so dare. A sound merger called the meat meat merger happens, where the long e and e vowels merge with each other to e. And that doesn't directly impact any of our example words here, but it did trigger a change in the lower air vowel, which raised in tongue position to fill the gap left by a. So our hypothetical word haver becomes haver, the word dare becomes de, and ep becomes ape. Like I said in the last video of this nature, as we get really close to modern English, it becomes clear that all the time sound changes have overlapped with each other a little bit. 
one change in this list isn't necessarily complete before the next one starts, although a certain order is necessary to explain the modern forms. Over the ensuing four or five hundred years, the r sound changes to r, the o and a diphthongs become ow and i, at least in my accent, the u and a monophthongs become u and a, and the r sound disappeared in my accent unless it was immediately followed by a vowel. So in our hypothetical word haver, we'd now have haver. The other words would be fowl, do, goose, mouse, mice, day, ape.